Um, so her talk today is titled, The Gods Make You Giggle, Finding Religion in Japanese Picture Books. So please join me in welcoming Heather Blair. Thank you very much for having me today. If we think that picture books for religion, or excuse me, if we think that picture books for children are innocent, we're kidding ourselves. As a foundational site for cultural transmission, picture books teach the youngest members of society who we are and how we fit into our world. Moreover, children's literature participates in the representational norms that govern prevailing discourses and popular media. The content, style, and imagery of picture books shape children's visual and narrative expectations as much as they respond to them. So if we want to understand how we came to be who we are and how we shape our children in and out of our own images, we need to look carefully at the media children use. In the case of Japan, this includes not only manga and anime, which, as you know, have received a great deal of attention fairly recently, but also picture books, which have not. So today, uh, I want to suggest that religion its characters, its virtues, its social dynamics, maintains a significant presence in post-war picture books. And please, let me be clear. I'm talking about mainstream picture books published by secular present presses and books that are held in public school libraries. I'm not talking about sectarian books published by religious organizations. So these are mainstream books. At the same time that I'm maintaining that religion is alive and well in picture books, I also need to acknowledge that the creators and audiences of these books perceive them to be part of a mainstream enterprise in non-religious education and entertainment. So to navigate these two imperatives, to recognize religion and kind of to refuse religion, I need to think of religion in a particular way, and this is what I'm going to propose to you. And I want to begin with an, uh, an observation. We, and here I mean both those of us here in the US and those of us there in Japan, tend to think of religion as a compound phenomenon, something that comes together as a conglomeration of different elements. And I'll take my own understanding of religion as an example here. I think of religion uh, more in terms of what it does than what it is. I see religion as orienting us in contexts ranging from the local to the cosmic. I see it doing that orienting by means of narrative, storytelling as well as through uh, propounding implicit rules and explicit rules. Religion supports, even constitutes, ethics. It encourages certain kinds of behavior while discouraging others. And in this respect, it not only tells us where we belong, but also how to get there. It compels us to engage in ritual. And by ritual, I mean highly codified forms of action that demand participation, that construct meaning, that channel feeling, and that organize relationships. Religion defines and sustains human communities. At the same time, it often moves us to revere gods or other supernatural beings. But I'm just a professor at Indiana University, and my thoughts don't exert all that much social force. <laughs> so let's take a look at another example that comes from Japanese law. Yeah. Of course, the Constitution guarantees freedom of religion in Article 20, but for something approaching a definition of what religion might actually be, we need to look to the Religious Corporations Act, which was passed in 1951, uh, and then revised in 1995. The first chapter of the act defines a religious organization as a shrine, and this is a long list, so bear with me. So a religious organization is a shrine, temple, church, monastery, or convent, or a denomination, church, or religious district whose primary purposes consist in the dissemination of religious teachings, and I'm quoting here, the conduct of ceremonies and functions, and the education and nurture of believers. Thus, to qualify as religious, an organization must have doctrine, ritual, and followers. Implicitly, these three elements in aggregate make up religion. And of course, we have to add institution or organization because, of course, that's what this law is all about. If this kind of aggregate uh, model is our model for religion, and I do think it is, and then I don't think it's surprising that some of us think that religion is coming apart in Japan. As of 2004, fewer than 10% of Japan's 128 million people recognized themselves as belonging to a religious group. 
And with every generation, the number of people claiming to have a faith shingle decreases. As ethnographers and sociologists have noticed, these trends are putting acute pressure on religious institutions. Rural temples and shrines are closing. And even urban institutions must diversify if they are to survive. Meanwhile, new religions are seeing decreases in membership and participation. Now, I'm perfectly willing to recognize that institutional religion has gone into abeyance in Japan. But I want to emphasize that if we look elsewhere, if we look, say, at picture books, we'll see religion not disappearing but transforming. The result is diffuse and acculturated, and many, probably most Japanese, would treat it as something substantively different from religion, shukyo. For these reasons, I'm going to be calling the religion I'm talking about today metamorphic religion to try and get at this slippage, that it's not recognized as religion, but I think it's a religion transformed. The metamorphic religion we find in Japanese picture books comes replete with a well-defined moral canon. It has a strong sense of tradition and a pantheon of superhuman entities. It promotes group, group cohesion while encouraging right behavior and a sense of wonder. At story time, children gather together as a community, not before a priest, but before a librarian or a teacher. So at present, I'm construing metamorphic religion as the result of three overlapping processes. And the first one I'm calling disaggregation. And with disaggregation, the constituent elements of an idealized or theoretically integrated version of quote unquote religion, they come unbundled from each other. Here's an example. <laughs> A visitor may leave an Emma prayer plaque at a shrine or a temple, but maintain that she does not do so for religious purposes. Julian Thomas, who took this picture, uh, calls this particular Emma an instance of tongue-in-cheek religion because with her DIY Emma, the painter shows her audiences that her undertaking belongs to something cooler and more playful than traditional religion. So the Emma is starting to come apart uh, together with her uh, recreated um, pilgrimage. So they're not a part of institutional religion. Disaggregated elements, whether they're practices, images, objects, or beliefs, are prone to migration, by which I mean a shift into other social domains conventionally viewed as separate from religion. For example, juzu or prayer bead bracelets are in many cases fashion statements these days without also being ritual objects. Sometimes we see disaggregated and or migrant elements re-aggregate into what looks a lot like religion but isn't necessarily recognized as such. An example here would be fan culture, and I hope you like the visual pun, ha ha. Here you see a couple of fans of the TV serial Inuyasha engaging in costume play, cosplay. So I confess uh, that I need to learn a lot more about fan culture, um, but I'm in, in agreement with uh, researchers who um, analyze it in terms of religion because its blend of orthodoxy, ritual, and community um, really lend it to that type of approach. So what I want to do today is to speak briefly to each one of these processes, uh, disaggregation, migration, re-aggregation, uh, based on examples from picture books. So first we'll talk about disaggregation. The careers of characters with religious pedigrees provide clear and useful instances of disaggregation. Popular examples uh, include, but are not limited to, Yamamba, the mountain crone, uh, who in medieval narrative is known for her, she, she likes to gobble up travelers, especially Buddhist monks and Yamabushi. Uh, and as you can see, um, in post-war picture books, she's still sometimes very scary and frightening and wicked and all of those exciting things, but she also becomes beneficent and friendly. We have a lot of books about Oni. Again, terrifying creatures, but in picture books they become pathetic. This guy really wants to make friends, but everybody's scared of him. It's very pathetic. It's a really sad book. Here, uh, this Oni has plotted to gobble up this little girl, but he has failed, and she has literally kicked his butt. And so now they have become friends and are playing uh, Kakurenbo. They're playing hide and seek together. We also have picture books featuring Jizo, popular bodhisattva of children and wayfarers. The Jizo on the right is uh, laughable. He's drooling over some 
<laughs> some um, daifuku that somebody has offered to him. But he can also be more serious. On the uh, right, you see a poor hat maker um, making offerings to uh, very chilly Jizo statues in the winter. More rarely, we have books about kami. Uh, the wind god on the right who plays with children and Okuninushi on the left in a uh, adaptation of a kojiki net. So all of these are rich and fun minds uh, and ways of looking into disaggregation. But today I'm going to focus on Dharma. And he shows us really clearly how a character may gradually disaggregate from institutional religion and then achieve a kind of independent apotheosis. So Dharma, also known as Bodhidharma, <coughs> is or was a 6th century South or Central Asian monk. He's long been revered as the patriarch of Zen Buddhism. He's been a stock figure in East Asian visual and textual culture for well over a millennium. And his dominant roles have been antidote to social convention. He was rude to the emperor and champion of fiercely dedicated religious practice. He's said to have meditated until his legs fell off. So during the Edo period in Japan, it became common to represent Daruma as a legless, weeble-style doll. And you see some contemporary dolls like that here. He's easily recognizable due to his barbarian goggle eyes and his bushy um, eyebrows. As you probably all know, you buy a Daruma doll, express a wish or prayer, and paint in one eye. Then when the wish or prayer comes true, you paint in the other eye and take the Daruma to a temple as a thanks offering. And this is an image from Katsuoji, a temple in northern Osaka uh, that is obviously known for its Darumas. So in some contexts, Daruma is still part of a uh, overtly religious context. The patriarch's apotheosis as a popular character in picture books is grounded in his earlier success as a wish-granting charm, but has a more proximate basis in the late 1960s when the author-illustrator Kako Satoshi adopted Daruma-chan, Little Daruma, as the protagonist for a best-selling series of picture books. As you can see here, this involved turning Daruma into a little boy. It also meant giving him an entire family who root him in a stable, post-war, middle-class home life with conservative gender roles. Mom cooks, little Daruma goes out and have, has adventures. So Kako clearly wanted a character who would stand in for the implied child reader. But why Daruma? In an interview in the year 2000, Kako explained his choice, describing a time when J the Japanese publishing industry had not yet recovered from the war and when he was not yet a professional author-illustrator. This is what he said, and the translation is mine. Around 1949, Showa 24, I was spending almost half the salary I earned at my company on foreign magazines for children. In those magazines, they had amazing pieces written by writers who couldn't publish their work during the war. So there were lots of fresh stories. One was the Little Matryoshka stories. I was surprised when I saw those. They were children's books that didn't feature children. And even though the characters were toys, they all had their own personalities. They were really good. Well, not so much good as provoking. And then he laughs. So I wanted to make something fun with a toy from my own country. And I thought about all kinds of things. Then I thought, Dharma really stands out. So that's what I chose. He's red, you know? I want to zero in on a slippage between Kako's expository conversational rhetoric and his narrative visual strategies. On the one hand, when Kako reimagined Dharma as a playful little boy, he had him befriend a cast of folkloric figure characters. Um, or among whom gods and semi-divine or demonic figures feature prominently. So in the first book, Daruma chan makes friends with a Tengu. And the way this works is that Daruma is envious of Tengu-chan's attributes. So he makes himself uh, cutting board geta sandals, and he gets a leaf fan and a soup bowl cap, uh, and then he makes a long cake out of, uh, oh, excuse me, a long nose out of rice cake. So that's why they're making mochi in that other picture. So it's to make a long nose for Daruma-chan. So for the non-Japanists, if there are any in the room, um, Tengu are ambivalent uh, creatures who live in the mountains. They're kind of the, the dark side. Um, they're not always mean, but they're kind of the dark side of Buddhist monastics. Uh, and these days, 
their uh, representation draws on the figure of Yamabushi, who are um, religious mountain practitioners. In another book, Dharma befriends the three Tenjin Chan. These are the sons of Papa Tenjin, the god of learning, who is the apotheosis of the ninth century literateur and statesman Sugawara no Michizane. In another, he plays with Daikoku Chan, who is the scion of a god of wealth and one of the seven lucky gods. So Kako's compound gesture of rendering Daruma cute and playing upon his religious valences has proven immensely successful. Some of Kako's little Daruma books have been reprinted nearly 100 times, while the franchise itself enjoys continued vitality. Daruma-chan to Yamame-chan is the seventh book in the series and was published in 2006. And here Daruma plays with the daughter of Yamamba. So Kako did jettison any associations with meditation or Zen, and he did focus on Daruma's material career as a lucky charm. However, in choosing other characters for the series, he also vividly reinstantiated, reinstantiated the patriarch as a loosely religious figure. And that's important because it really was Kako who popularized Daruma in the picture book sphere. That said, in the hands of other picture book creators uh, in the more recent uh, years, Daruma's religious air has tended to dissipate. So we have a fuller disaggregation taking place in post-millennial picture books. So for example, <laughs> here you see Daruma as a hapless participant in absurdity. I personally like the Elvis uh, hairdo with the silly mustache. More often, he's abstracted into something that, as Kako said, is red, you know? Well, red and round. So in this book, uh, what's happening is that a bear and a mouse family have come to visit their new neighbors, the Daruma family. And they're getting a tour of the house. Uh, and they're amazed and amused by the Daruma family's sleeping arrangements. Um, and the way that this works is that the beds are at the bottom of this bowl-shaped hole. <laughs> And the reason for that is to ensure that nobody, when people roll out of bed to, at night, that they don't roll too far and get into an accident. <laughs> so this is a joke that trades on roundness, right? So we've got round and red. And those really become, that's what Daruma is all about. Uh, books like this um, are actually building on a series by Kagakui Hiroshi. Uh, this was a blockbuster series that was first published between 2007 and 2008. As you can guess from the titles, these books teach basic grammar to babies and toddlers. Kagakui actively simplified and focused his books by adopting a white ground, using minimal text, and repeating a set and therefore predictable pattern. In Daruma-san to, with Daruma-san, an initial setup is repeated, first with a strawberry, then with a banana, then with a melon, and then with everybody, each time with a gently silly result. So there are lots of things I think that we could say about how these books construct sociality for their intended child readers. But I want to point out that we're really focusing on Daruma here. So for Daruma, uh, these books really work as a serious uh, isolation and also a recontextualization. So the patriarch is now a fruit. And as far as I'm concerned, that's, that's disaggregation right there, when you take a patriarch and turn him into a fruit. So I want to move into re, uh, excuse me, to migration. And here, uh, I want to note, we're already seeing this. The key dynamic is play. So overall, the metamorphic religion that we find in picture books is fun, even goofy. And some years ago, Julian Thomas, who took the Emma picture that I showed you earlier, coined the term shukyo asobi, by which he meant both religious play and play with religion. And this concept gets right at what goes on in picture books. So I'm going to tell you about picture books about hell. But you're all living in North America now, so I want you to imagine for just a minute that there is a really popular picture book series, and it's about hell. It's about Christian hell. And nobody thinks that it's Christian. And nobody thinks that it's anti-Christian. And everybody thinks that it's funny, and everybody loves it. It's, I don't know about you, but for me, that's almost impossible. 
But in Japan, it's not. Plus, we're talking about Buddhist hell, not Christian hell. Now, I don't have time to go into too much detail, um, but there's a bit of a story to how hell has migrated into picture books and then settled down to stay in picture books. The epical event here was the publication of Jigoku no Sobe, or Sobe in Hell. Uh, and this came out in 1978. This book built on plentiful uh, adaptations of folk, folk tales that had been published for children during the 50s and 60s, uh, as well as revitalized interest in traditional arts and crafts as a source of national identity and pride. Its signal contributions to what I'm calling metamorphic religion in picture books were A, its fusion of hell with humor, and B, its transformation of hell's grotesquerie from something that uh, middle class sensibilities might find distasteful to a matter of national tradition. So he really built up enthusiasm for hell. Tajima managed this through several strategies. First, he explicitly undertook a cross-media adaptation. He turned the last portion of a story from the repertoire of the Rakugo master, Katsura Beicho, into a picture book. <laughs> it's a great picture, yeah? <laughs> and for those of you who are interested, um, the title of the story is Jigoku Bakke uh, Moja no Tawamure. So in terms of the cultural capital at work here, I think it's also important to note that Beicho was designated a national treasure in 1996. <laughs> so the adaptation of the Rakugo uh, was a, a, a kind of dynamic gesture that it once was about vernacular, because Rakugo is a vernacular tradition, but it's also about high culture, because this vernacular tradition was being elevated um, on the national stage. So the picture book centers on an acrobat named Sobe, who dies after falling um, from his tightrope during a stunt. In the Land of the Dead, he meets several other rogues, and together they outwit Emma, the king of hell and his demons. They do this through moxie and by using the prof professional skills that they had honed in the land of the living. Linguistically, Tajima framed hell as a matter of vernacular tradition by writing the story in a really thick and rich Osaka dialect. Depending on the reader's native linguistic context, this lends the story a homey, old-timey, or even downright ethnographic feel. It also requires adult co-readers to perform the dialect. So I'll be honest, I don't speak Osaka Ben, and reading this book out loud is always an adventure for me. It's a challenge, it's a delight, but it's also, it's work. And that turns all of us, at least for the time and space of the book, into exuberant participants in Tajima's, and by extension, Beicho's vernacular project. Visually, Tajima rendered his figures using black outlines that recall wood block prints or paper cuts. They're also delightfully lumpy, so they have this kind of folksy quality to them. And he used a palette based on traditional colorants like indigo, you see that up in the corner, and matter root. So here again, we have a vernacularization, if you will. In terms of narrative, where the visual and the verbal come together, Tajima followed Beicho's lead and reveled in the flat-out grotesquerie of hell. Here, Emma casts his prisoners into a pit of stinking excrement. But Sobe and his friends bait Emma and the demons into fishing them out and moving them on <laughs> to another torture. So they say, this is, yeah, bring it. We can take it, man. <laughs> We've seen so much worse. And Emma falls for it. So then, when a giant demon gobbles them up at Emma's direction, the doctor shows the others how to manipulate the demon's guts until the demon sneezes and farts them out. <laughs> In all of these respects, the adaptive mode, the linguistic, visual, and narrative style, Tajima invoked and constructed hell as Japanese tradition. His implicit argument has proven tremendously compelling. Hell is now earthy, funny, irreverent, playful, part of a shared past that gives meaning to our ongoing lives. I'll just show you a couple of examples to back that statement up. Um, this is a, a pretty new book. Um, and here, an Ikebana master a uh, very scribbly Ikebana master is teaching demons in hell to use Needle Mountain, Harinoyama, as a frog to hold uh, the blooms in a flower arranging project upright. 
Here, the Bodhisattva Jizoro is ordering another bowl of ramen, hellaciously hot ramen, from King Emma, who, in this book, has become a venal small businessman. <laughs> and here, you see a deliciously absurd and very complex representation of hell as commercial spectacle. Emma and all the demons are busy selling hell souvenirs at a department store. <laughs> So all of these books link hell vividly to familiar aspects of everyday <coughs> life. So it's very vernacular in a contemporary sense as well. They also all presume and impart knowledge of hell to child readers. So hell is now part of the need to know repertoire of young Japanese kids. And in this image I want to do one last thing which is to draw your attention to an image in the background there. That's Sobe walking on his tightrope. All right, so now I want to talk a little bit about re-aggregation, in which multiple elements coalesce at the level of the entire book to produce religion in a metamorphic mo mode. To illustrate a couple of ways that this can happen, I want to take a look at two different books. The first one, Dharma no Shugyo, or Dharma Practice, uh, is by first-time author, illustrator, Masegi Rieko. And I'm looking for my slide here. Okay. So this book, and I'm going to put it in Confucian terms here, is all about self-cultivation as a means to repair and perfect interpersonal relationships. And I chose it because it picks up on both infernal imagery and dharma. So two friends, you can see them here, Sakura-chan and Rudi-chan, have had a fight, and they attend the dharma matsuri. <coughs> there, a vendor gives the girls a bargain on a pair of dharmas. And the dolls, they seem to be kind of alive. They give a startling leap. And Sakura and Ruri follow them as they roll through a hole among the tree roots into an underworld. This, we soon learn, is the land of the Darumas. This is where Darumas come to undertake Shugyo, or practice. Importantly, Shugyo has a religious nuance, and it verges on the ascetic. Shugyo is challenging practice, right? It's something where you really have to exert yourself. And what will happen for the dharmas is that if they um, triumph in their practice, they will mature into real grown-up independent dharmas who can indeed grant wishes. So the dharmas enter the dharma dojo, <laughs> the place of dharma practice, and there they encounter the dharma boss who sets them three tasks. And each of these is meant to perfect a key uh, ability for the dharmas. And the book uses playful verbs to describe these, but I think it's also worth translating them from Japanese into English and from a playful childish register into a serious adult idiom. So I will be doing that as we go forward here. So the first trial, <laughs> the first challenge is okiagaru, or getting up again. And this is what dharma dolls are known for. So I don't have a good, so you, because they're like weebles, right? So you pop one down and it pops right back up. So that's what the girls are going to learn how to do. In adult terms, we might call that resilience. And they learn this by doing a lion dance. Next, they learn gamansuru. How do you do this? Well, by not laughing when you're tickled. <laughs> and what's going on here is instruction in forbearance or stamina. And then they learn to behave in a steadfast manner, doshirito, even when they feel frightened. In fact, uh, the dharmas and the girls who are capable of tumbling from the big tower with courage uh, do become mature dharmas who can grant wishes. And here you see the color is a great change, right, from the frightened purple to the happy gold. In the last spread, Sakura and Rudi are reunited at the bottom of the tree. Their shared trials have resolved their differences. And uh, oftentimes, picture books um, play a lot with the end papers and the fly leaves. And on the fly leaf, right above the um, publisher's information, you see the bottom of the dharmas. And they've both wished for naka naori, which means to, to make up with each other. So they've actually had their wishes granted. By my lights, this book can fairly be construed as religious. Uh, in several respects. It re-aggregates elements into something that looks and works like shukyo at the same time that it operates in a different domain, namely picture books. It features a supernatural setting, a subterranean other world that it opens onto and returns to what seems to be a shrine. 
We have divine or semi-divine figures, the dharmas, who intriguingly have their own arc that they have to follow from immaturity to adulthood. We have explicitly articulated virtues, resilience, forbearance, stoutness of heart. Indeed, the whole book works to valorize nakayoshi, friendship or getting along, which is treated as a, even the, consummate good in many, many Japanese picture books. Furthermore, the book as a whole narrates a rite of passage in which shugyo, dedicated practice, yields benefits that hover on the cusp of the spiritual and the social. Now, Dharma no shugyo is comparatively didactic. Um, and even though it does play with grotesquery and fantasy, it's quite explicit about the virtues and dispositions that it's trying to cultivate. Uh, other works are situated at another end of the multiple picture book spectrums. Um, and I'd like to show you one more re-aggregating book because I want to give a sense of that diversity. So the author here is a guy named Rai Ryoji. Uh, and I like this picture of him because he began his career as an illustrator but has since become something of an auteur. He's become very famous and he's now creating his own picture books rather than illustrating books written by uh, other authors. Especially compared to the other material I have been showing you, his work is much more conceptual. He uses philosophy, play, color, and rhythm to suggest that there are worlds within worlds and that all worlds are interconnected. Arai's 2009 Uchu Tamago, or Cosmic Egg, presents the act of painting as an act of world creation. Cosmogony is a favorite theme for Arai, and Uchu Tamago begins as an experiment in which the artist and reader discover together and experience wonder. The book opens. I filled my ye brush with yellow paint, and gyun, I went around. Gyun, I made a line. Kucha, kucha, gusha, kusha, I painted a yellow egg. Yes, a yellow egg. It's a cosmic egg. Yes, that's it, a cosmic egg. With the story underway, the language develops into a chant as rhythm and color bring the world into being. To convey the meter, I'm going to read in Japanese while projecting my English translation onto the screen. Tamago, tamago, uchu, tamago. Atakai ne, akka. Kimochi ne, ao. Tamago, tamago, uchu, tamago. Tamago, tamago, uchu, tamago. Uchu no ka san kara detan da. Attakai ne, akka. Kimochi ne, ao. Uchu ka san, uchu, tamago. Uchu, tamago, uchu, tamago. Uchu ka san, uchu, tamago. Boku ude ippai no bashite. Gyun, tamago, tamago. Boku, tamago. As the book, and the world continue to unfold, more complex patterns develop. And it becomes apparent that there may be more than one world. That each world, excuse me, that each being may be a world in itself. And yet this means not alienation, nor separation, but rather mutuality. Here the text reads, inside this egg, the sun comes out. My sun comes out. Inside the egg, the sun comes out. Your sun comes out. It's bright, isn't it? The yellow of the sun. With the proliferation of beings, we see eggs in the world, which presumably is in itself an egg. <laughs> so we have eggs within eggs, and we have eggs that are clearly our world. Then, finally, at the end of the book, an oscillation from microcosm to macrocosm reinforces this kaleidoscopic view of worlds within worlds. Images of the cosmic mother, who fantastically is a chicken, Shift from mother as the world to mother, whoops, mother in the world. So here she is the world, and here she's in the world. Adai's focus on becoming an interconnection, as well as the way he relativizes scale, marks several of his other recent projects as well. These books push against any hierarchy of values to maintain that all landscapes, city, forest, desert, etc., are equally good. By extension, Arai crosses the humanoid with the animal, and sometimes also the built, representing all beings and all places as radically equal parts of an organic, endless whole. How does Uchu Tamago aggregate its constituent elements into something religious? Well, it narrates origins and takes on a strong mythic bent. In doing so, it orients us within the cosmos, and this involves relating us to others. 
I would maintain that the meter and repetition lend the book a liturgical quality that really comes to the fore when you read it out loud. The book is thus performative for the adult co-reader. But it's also true that it's performative for the child co-reader, who, for once, is invited to identify not with a character depicted visually in the book, but with the painter, the narrator, the one who occupies what I like to think of as the God position, because in this case, we're bringing the world into being, and the child is invited to participate in that. Importantly, the work of creation is less one of perfection or satisfaction, but rather of play and wonder. So, I have lots more books <laughs> that exemplify reaggregation. Uh, some of them are morality tales, others are theodicies, others are adventures. And so my point here is that um, when I am saying that uh, contemporary and uh, other uh, sort of post-war up until the contemporary period, that picture books are functioning religiously, that doesn't mean that they're all the same. So there is this uh, real diversity. And in turn, that makes it difficult, if not impossible, to argue that there's any orthodoxy in picture book religion. Uh, so that's a point in favor of considering this kind of religion as a religion transformed, as, as something that's really radically different from our stereotypical vision of institutional religion as real religion. But uh, in closing, what I want to do is um, switch gears a little bit. So here I want to talk about what I see as the way of picture books, ehondo. So this is a shift from looking at the images and the texts of picture books to looking at their reception. So it's a different kind of evidence here. Um, and I started to notice that, I, I started to think this thought that, oh, there's really, there's this way of picture books this summer when I was doing research in Japan. Uh, and I find this evidence mostly in the rich adult literature of, of picture book appreciation as well as in the institutional frameworks that support the publication and reading of picture books, museums, libraries, and so on. Uh, just like the metamorphic religion that I see to be operating in children's literature in general, the way of picture books uh, remains implicit. Right? So this is something that I'm bringing into being by talking about it. It's not something that people are talking about using this terminology. This is my terminology and my idea. So it's my fault. <laughs> so um, as you all know, Japanese society is dotted by capital W ways, michi, do, of various kinds. Calligraphy, shodo, literally the way of writing. Tea ceremony, sado, the way of tea. Uh, the martial arts are full of ways, right? Kyudo, archery. Kendo, the way of the sword, judo. Rarely, if ever, are these ways construed as examples of religion or shukyo, and yet, socially speaking, they do provide participants with a like-minded community while lending structure and meaning to their lives. And we see this with uh, the way of picture books as well. So, key elements of a way include the following, and here you're just gonna have to take my word for it, because uh, I don't have time to give you examples to convince you, so just believe me, okay? Rules for behavior, often articulated as precepts. Uh, expectation of uh, thorough commitment by participants. An ethos of discipline and regular practice. Recognized masters, organized groups of followers, cardinal virtues, a place of practice, dojo, and a firm conviction that the way is learnable. And that means that uh, practice and process itself is really important. It's not just product and arrival. So. I can't talk about all of that in the way of picture books, but I do want to comment on a couple. So first, as a kind of manifesto uh, for the way of picture books, consider the following comments from Daigo Yuko. So Daigo is a mother and picture book lecturer, or ehon koshi. And for those of you who work on medieval Japanese religion, this is great because koshi is the word for a lecturer in a Buddhist rite. So this is a very old word, koshi or koji sometimes. And it's reused here. So she's a picture book lecturer, um, and she's been trained through the nonprofit Center for Child Rearing with Picture Books. This is an NGO that's quite active in Japan right now. She reflects upon her favorite childhood picture book, Ryu no Me no Amida, Tears from the Eyes of a Dragon, and recounts the transformative effects of re-encountering the book as an adult. I quote, I was taught, and here she's referring to her training as a 
lecturer. I was taught that picture books harbor the power to rock the human spirit. Believing that, I came to enjoy picture book time with my son. But not to have understood that I myself should have derived such great power from a picture book. And then to realize as an adult that my absolute favorite picture book should have formed my character, the core of what I live for, that it had exerted an influence on my interpersonal relationships with all the people I've met, and that it gave me the great power to live. My feelings overflowed as though I had received an unexpected gift. The sense of revelation and of life-changing affect are really striking here. I don't think it's at all overdoing it to say that Daigo had a religious experience mediated by a picture book. But the way of picture books is not all affect. There's also discipline. So experts and novices alike are convinced that there are right and wrong books and right and wrong ways to choose them. Picture book authors and publishers have opined on this topic for decades. And over the summer, I came up with, uh, I found one numbered set of rules laid out by uh, Waki Akiko. Uh, and I really liked these. Uh, Waki is an academic who writes on fantasy and child psychology. She's also a children's author. Um, and these rules occur at the conclusion to her um, edited volume that was published in 2011. Um, and I like them because they're so pithy. So I'll just read them to you quickly. There are seven. One, before choosing something because it's cute or pretty, take the time to get to know the story. What children want is to grow, not to be infantilized. Better a story you can experience together than a message or a teaching. Stories in which trouble creates opportunities are the best. Beware of humor that looks down on others. Take a hard look at the anthropomorphic qualities in an animal protagonists. Better words that strike home than well-turned phrases. For Waki, good picture books are substantive, even challenging. They evince and encourage respect for others. And they need not be pretty, but they must be compelling. Although she does not explicitly engage with the question of what happens if a book is ill-chosen or just plain bad, the sense that a picture book might work significant damage does lurk in the background in this and other discussions aimed at parents and educators. So quality really matters. This is very serious stuff. So for my last point on um, the way of picture books, I want to talk briefly about the Katsura Bunko, uh, which is a dojo. It's a place of practice for the way of picture books. And it brings a couple of elements into play as well. So the Katsura Bunko, like other Bunko, um, was founded, it, 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 it's part of a movement. There's something called the Bunko movement, which started in the 50s. And this was uh, founded in um, 1958, I believe. Uh, so the founders of the Bunkos created these libraries. They're small, they're private, they're domestic. Uh, and they wanted to create these as purposeful alternatives to public institutions because they felt that public libraries were prone to several problems. First, they were few in number. Uh, second, they were not easily accessible. And third, they didn't serve children. So these were private libraries in neighborhoods uh, run mostly by women on a volunteer basis in their own homes. And this one was founded by Ishii Momoko. So Ishii is famous on multiple counts. Uh, she was a noted illustrator, excuse me, a, no a noted author and translator. Uh, she's the one who translated uh, The Tale of Peter Rabbit and uh, Winnie the Pooh into Japanese. Uh, and she was a tireless advocate for children's literature. She's known as the founder of the Bunko movement. So this is you know, where it all started. This Bunko is located in Ogikubo, uh, a suburban district in western Tokyo. And since Ishii's death in 2008, it's been administered by the Tokyo Children's Library. It's staffed by volunteers. Um, there is still an active children's room, uh, which is located on the first floor with direct access to the street. It's open on Saturday afternoons. And when I visited, three staff members, volunteers, women who appeared to be in their 30s, greeted us, chatted with us, uh, and they welcomed us and all of the other kids who came by reading books and you know, really engaging the kids. Um, and the goal here is for the children to look at the books that they want to look at in an undirected manner. 
But the book, the book also hosts regular story time sessions that verge on the liturgical. So an hour or so after opening, someone rings a bell, and then it's time for ohanashi, a talk, or what we would call story time in North America. A staff member invites interested children to, to, children to enter the story room, which is next door to the library room, and no adults are allowed. But I got a tour, so I know that it's got curtains and a candle. So they light a candle. So I, you know, I was just, and I'm, I'm shut out, so it's all this secret, the secret ritual that's going on inside, right? Um, in addition, uh, the Bunko has expanded since Ishii's death, uh, and so there are now research rooms, and they have some collections which are of interest to researchers. But the thing that really grabbed me was Ishii's office, which is something of a shrine now. As we entered, my guide told me that this was the portion of the house where she had lived. And this is her desk. And we have kept it just the way it was when she was doing her work. Now, I didn't take pictures, more fool me, uh, but it, does, it looks just like that, except for that she's not there. So um, there's a sanctification going on here uh, in the world of picture books, education, and child rearing. Ishii has become a saint. She's a recognized master. I hadn't come on the correct adult visiting day, but uh, I was received as having made a pilgrimage. So one staff member said to another, she came all the way from Sendagi, which is on the other side of Tokyo, right? <laughs> so they were, uh, but it takes an hour and a half to get there, right? So they were recognizing me for having shown an appropriate level of sincerity and devotion, and so therefore they accommodated me and treated me as, you know, a member of the Way of Picture Books because I had shown that I was, you know, I was there for serious reasons. So, I don't imagine that it's going to be deeply surprising to anyone in this room that the social world of picture books should have emerged as a discrete subculture in Japan. We do a lot of research on Japanese subcultures, right? But I do think that it's important to recognize that this domain of action, the production and appreciation of picture books, has organized itself along really familiar lines. In arguing that picture books often exhibit religious traits, serve religious functions, and elicit religious reactions, I'm not trying to unmask picture books in order to mount an ideological critique, although that would certainly be possible. Instead, I want to point out that symbolic and social configurations familiar to us from religious contexts continue to structure and animate Japanese culture, even though many Japanese find institutional forms of religion very unattractive. In this respect, what I'm calling metamorphic religion may be the Japanese analog for the types of discursive, social, physical practices that Americans like to call spiritual, but not religious. And we don't have that particular discourse in Japan, but we do have this other pattern that I'm talking about today. Why might this be important? Well, especially in English, assessments of secularity in Japan have tended to focus on two things. The trials and tribulations of institutional religion, here a shrine falling apart, and the involvement of government officers or government agencies in ritual activity, especially at shrines, like Yasukuni. I think that kind of research is deeply important. I'm 100% behind it. But I want to end today by advocating for more, more robust crosstalk among those of us looking at civil religion and its political significance, those of us who look at institutional religion and its social significance, and religion as it might be apprehended and approached through cultural studies, religion in the domains of popular culture, the arts, sports, and picture books. It's by working to synthesize our findings across these different fields that we stand the best chance of learning how and where religious patterns operate in Japan's nominally irreligious or mushu-gyo society. So thank you very much.